Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Nutritional Revolution Podcast. We are super excited for our guest today. I'm personally pumped to pick his brain. <laughs> we have Dr. Ian Dunican. He is a sleep and performance expert and uh, currently working at the University of Western Australia. And we're going to pick his brain on all things sleep for performance because he knows a lot about sleep for an athlete and he is an athlete himself. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Ian. No problem. You've actually told a lie straight away, Kyla. Uh oh, you're not an athlete. Well, I don't know if I'm an athlete, um, but I actually don't yes. work at the University of Western Australia. You don't? You did. No, I have an I have an adjunct position there, which is like a, a an adjunct position in Australia is like a privileged position. Um, to say it's a privileged position, but I think it's a privileged position for them because I my research goes through there, and they get they look like I work there, but they actually oh. don't pay me any money. Oh, but all my all my research is funded through my own two businesses, Melius Consulting and Sleep for Performance. So I'm completely 100 percent independent. Oh, or as wow. I like to as I like to say, I cannot be cancelled. <laughs> yes, that's great. That's great. So you're, you're all my boss. research, all my research <laughs> is self-funded through my business. Yeah. So wow. yeah, I technically work. I I'm the director and chief advisor of Melius Consulting and Sleep for Performance, and my wow. research goes through University of Western Australia. So I don't get, oh, cool. I don't actually technically work there. In case I say something and then someone runs off to the university yes. and goes, "That guy said blah blah blah." Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but your PhD is from the University Correct. of West Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So I, I did I did postgraduate uh, study there and my PhD at University of West Australia. And I still have an adjunct senior research fellow position there as well. I'm not bagging that. I just want to make sure people know that I'm not yes. working for the university. Yes. Okay, great. So I told them. <laughs> There's my two truths and lies <laughs> um, right at the beginning of the episode. Um, yeah. So we briefed we briefed Ian on the two truths and lies. So before we learn any more about you, about um, maybe background and stuff, why don't we dive straight into your two truths and a lie, and then Amanda and I will take a guess at it. Two truths and a lie. Okay, so I wrote these down just to make sure that I didn't go, uh, go off piece on them. So um, I was going to say the first truth, but it's, it might be a lie. <laughs> um, so I was... Uh, I'm technically Chinese, probably, but you could say because I was born in Hong Kong. Okay. Um, the second thing is, um, when I was at high school, my English and history teacher said I should be an actor and I should have went to acting school. Okay. And then the last one is that I once ran for 28 hours continuously. Oh, Okay. I feel like the last there, one's there might, because there might, there might be all lies. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's gonna make it hard. I feel like the running one for twenty eight hours is true because you do some ultra running stuff. If I recall correctly from our research on you, um, I yeah, mean, but is the twenty eight hours true? That's the question you might want. That to is the question. People have pulled little twists on us where it's like twenty five hours or thirty hours or, yeah. um, okay. I feel like you could be an actor. I can see it. Cause you're just like fast with your delivery you rain fires. I feel like you could absorb that. I don't know if you were born in Hong Kong. I think that's the lie. What do you think, Amanda? Why? Well, Hong Kong, Hong Kong was under British rule and Irish and Britain had a lot of history. <laughs> so technically it could be born there. My dad might've been like a banker and I was that's... born in Hong Kong. Could have grew up back in Ireland. It's true. That could be true. But now you're, I don't know. I feel like, <laughs> what do you think? Amanda? Going, I That one's too... That one's too like wild to not be true, I think. Really? So okay. I'm gonna go with the ran for 28 hours, but maybe you actually ran for like 28 and a half. Mm. 28 okay. hours and 20 minutes or something. So I think oh, that less. you did run for a really long time. <laughs> yeah. I feel like there's no but, doubt you ran for a long time in some of your races. I think I think the, the hours might be a um, fudge there. I can see the actor thing. Yeah. Especially by a teacher. You know. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, don't tell us the answer. We're going to reveal it maybe throughout the episode. But definitely, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Tune in next the, week. Yeah. What is, it, um, what is it? The voiceover actors. I feel like you could even do so that. that. That's actually a joke in my house. So for years, I do voiceovers when shows come on or, co or when they tail off at the end. So oh particularly in Ireland and England, we have this like um, the voiceovers for uh, BBC, Channel 4, will tend to have somebody from Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales and do a kind of voiceover thing. So as the show is kind of petering out and the credits are rolling, a voice will come in and go, well, let's find out next week if Amanda and Kala get into same trouble this week. Tune in next <laughs> Tuesday at nine o'clock to find out what conundrum they're in. Oh, Up my next goodness. Is the news at nine o'clock? Stay tuned. 
That's great. Can you do different accents too? Well, that's like that's a kind of very mild Scottish, but I can do like mm-hmm. a more of an, uh, an, a harsh Irish one then, um, which oh uh, which is my own accent, which I tried to fake. <laughs> yeah, that's so. <laughs> but funny. yeah, oh but, uh, but uh, it's kind of a joke in our house. So um, I said to my wife. Um, that maybe next year I might just go and audition for voice acting to see what happens. Oh my, I feel like you should. Yeah. You're great. <laughs> I, um, my, my wife would say, don't encourage me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. I was just on a bike ride last Saturday with a, one of our biking <clears throat> friends and he was just spitting off all these different accents and he was shockingly good. He did the Irish, he did the Scottish, he did Australian. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was impressive. I'm going to have to have him listen to this episode so he can hear your yeah, ear. He, he, he might like to... Um, you might like my South African accent as well, because I, I was in the South African military and I used to fight it, of course, Zimbabwe and Maputo and Mozambique and these other places. So it can be so good sometimes that my friend from South Africa, from Joburg, he actually, I fooled him once actually on the phone. No way. Yeah, yeah. You I could fooled be him, a yeah. spy. You could be an undercover spy, I feel like. Maybe that could be a truth. <laughs> I should put all of those truth and lies. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That's impressive. <laughs> Oh, anyway, man. Let's, not, okay. let's, let's not get sidetracked on, on yes. crap. Let's let's get into the episode. <laughs> exactly. Let's talk about sleep. Um, okay, so why don't you take us back a little bit of ways and kind of share with us how you got excited to study sleep? Okay, I'll give you the kind of cliff notes um, okay. because it is a bit of a weird story. And many people ask me how I got into sleep and then they look at me with their eyes crossed and go, What? So I was never sitting at school, chewing a pencil, looking out the window, going, I want to be a sleep scientist. I wanted to be in the military. I wanted to do something physical. Mm. I had no interest in academia. So in the last year of high school, I actually dropped out halfway through and joined the military. Hmm. And I ended up doing the probably the equivalent, like a high school diploma myself. Did five years in the military and then was like, OK, that's great physically, but wasn't cognitively challenged. Left there and. Um, did a course to become a fitness trainer, like a personal trainer, was working in a gym, met my wife, who's Australian. We moved to Australia 20 odd years ago. Wow. So when I came here, I went down the path of getting into health and safety and in mining oil and gas. Mm. And I worked for a mining company for 10 years. Wow. I kept jumping between health and safety and business improvement. So during that time, I did my undergraduate degree and then I did a master's in business um, and a master's in engineering as well. And a about probably 16 years ago, there was a problem in that business around managing fatigue mm. uh, between human resources, health and safety and operations. Mm. And so I was just brought into problem solve for a half a day. Wow. That's all that happened. And then that led to a whole new project starting that became like, you know, sort of um, for a few operations, then kind of the whole state of Western Australia. And then it became a global role. And um and from there, that's just really kind of how, how it happened. And I just come in more and more into sort of like what we call fatigue management and safety management systems in mining. And then I was getting lots of calls from um, performance people, because if you look at the literature, it really sort of kicked off around 2010, 2011 for athletic research and sleep. And I was getting lots of calls from, from different groups. And um, because I had a background in endurance running um, and jujitsu and played rugby as well growing up. So those things kind of sort of complemented those, those skills. And then I decided it was time to go back and do a PhD. Um, I did have a crack at a PhD previously, but it sort of fell over. It's very difficult to do when you're full-time working. And it gets kind of, the lines are a bit gray. And so I decided that I would go back and do it in in sleep. And I let a few people know. And within 24 hours, I had about seven projects offered to me from a rugby team and uh, oh. from the Australian Institute of Sport as well. So because I got a background in combat sports, and being in the military, the combat center in, in Canberra and the other side of the country was a perfect fit as well. So I didn't go and live there, but I went back before doing studies and then with the rugby team here at Western Four. So it was just a perfect on-ramp. And I was, oh. I think I was like 37 at the time. Mm-hmm. So having a mature age kind of PhD student, people were kind of rubbing their hands going, I'm going to get a lot of free work here, probably a lot of horsepower. So it, it benefited them and me as well. And then when I finished my PhD in 2017, I started up Amelia's Consulting and Sleep for Performance and it's just kind of grown since then. Wow. So media wow. consultant is really focused on industry, mm-hmm. sleep for performance on athletes, but also it gives back a lot of sleep for performance. If you go to the site, there's the podcast. We've had seminars over the last three years. We write lots of blogs. Um, we also um, work with PhD students. We also sponsor a lot of events and we give back a lot to PhD students as well, prize money, travel grants. Um, we sponsor a lot of early career research sessions as well. So that's really key for 
for me to promote people coming through as well because I got lots of good chances along the way you know I didn't come that classic kind of academic path Mm -hmm. and so I want to try and promote people to come in different ways behind us to to kind of keep adding to this body but yeah that's that's how that's kind of the weird way I got into it yeah Yeah. wow that's really amazing so the initial thing you said you sat in for half a day on a fatigue so in your current position you're they were noticing the fatigue playing into performance or injury risk on the job or well it was mainly about compliance like government mm. regulation that came out but if you think about um so here in western australia it's probably the biggest hub in the world for and if you look at some of my research i've done work in this area and um, it's the biggest hub in the world for what we call fly on fly out so people will go away maybe for a week mm. work for 12 hours each day so like do 84 hours in a week then they will fly back to a city like perth and they'll have a week off so that so it's like a week on week off you see wow. this happening in canada as well it's not as, as po- it's not as much as popular in in, a, in the u.s mm-hmm. a little bit in canada for some projects but not so much in the u.s <clears throat> itself and so yeah. um maybe for projects getting developed but in operations not really and so people go away for a week or two weeks and then come home and then they live in this kind of cabin called a donger which has like a bed a slight small ensuite and a tv um and then yeah, that's they will just work really hard for that period of time and then come back. And typically they wow. do maybe do a week of days, a week of nights, and have two weeks off or a week off. There's all different kind of roster systems around that. So there's impact wow. into productivity, there's impact to injuries, obviously, there's health and wellness. If you don't have enough people, then it impacts your operational capacity or uptime. This is where my engineering stuff started coming in, looking at asset management. So, mm. you know, good sort of optimization of people and looking after them and keeping them in the business will also enable good productivity yeah. and less variation in productivity. And then also have a kick on or a knock on to the financial benefit because you're not having to pay overtime or bring in extra people and so on. So it's looking at from a health and safety, a people, a productivity and a financial aspect as well. That's awesome. Wow. So fascinating. So when you then kind of went into the athlete space at that yeah. time, were you already involved you had mentioned rugby yeah ultra running were you already kind of in that world at that point so that, at that time i was probably deep into ultra running i've been ultra mm-hmm. running for a number of years so um probably the, the the most probably the biggest race i've done is probably the one in the u.s which you may have heard of called as the leadville 100 oh yeah one, yeah so i've done that twice uh first year yes. i got to 88 miles and then couldn't go anymore but i had a bit of, we had a bit of a tragedy the night before the race my wife's mother died back in australia so it was quite hectic oh no yeah. and so we're like let's just do this and then we'll get the plane back and and sort of you know so that was all in my mind so i got to 88 miles and i didn't really prepare for that in terms of the altitude acclimatization well enough mm-hmm. so then i went back the following year and spent uh, two weeks up at leadville which is at ten thousand feet and then ran wow. the race and, and finished it so yeah did it take you 28 hours? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't make an answer to that. That's the truth than a lie. <laughs> I'm trying to get that it out sneaky. of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, it was 27 hours, 42 minutes. Um, oh. Yeah. So anyway, and then I was doing lots of ultras here in, in Australia as well. So I was deep in it. And I was also doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well at the time, which I still do. <clears throat> Hence my black eye today. So if anybody's oh, wondering why I I didn't even eye, notice it's... that. It's because of uh, jujitsu yesterday. It's not, and it's, Ouch. yeah, it's, it's not, be- it's actually not even sore. It's not even raised. It's just a mark. It's just yeah. discoloration. Um, and so, yeah, so it's mainly into that. I stopped playing rugby when I was probably in my early 20s after about mm. 10 or 11 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, started doing just more martial arts and running. And then the last probably four or five years, I've been doing ultra swimming. So swimming up to 20 kilometer swims in the ocean. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. So Goodness. That's my, that's my latest thing. Yeah. That's impressive. Okay. So before we dive into all things sleep and all the uh, like questions we got from our listeners and, and clients over the years, um, can you give us a little breakdown of maybe what is happening in our brains and bodies when we sleep and why sleep is important? Wow. That could be a four day question answer to be answered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's actually happening? There's lots of things happening. Why it's all happening. We don't really know. Mm-hmm. so we still don't know if you go to a scientific conference and you put your hand up and say why do we sleep there's a multitude of reasons of why we sleep but mm-hmm. there's not one root cause of to say like we're sleeping because we need to do this mm-hmm. so there's lots of different things happening and in general we break these processes or i do anyway, when i talk to people into two different parts mm-hmm. what's happening to the body as you said and then what's happening basically to the brain and so you may have heard of sleep stages before mm-hmm. REM, non-REM and so on so we think about a little graph in our head at the very top we're awake. And then when we go to sleep, you think about it's just like kind of going down a hill. Mm. We go deeper and deeper and deeper. So we have stage one or N1, N2, 
N3. And then we may come back up into REM. So lots of people think that REM is a deep uh, stage of sleep. That's actually not true. Mm. Um, the deepest stage of sleep is N3. Mm. And this is really important for physical repair and recovery. So N1, 2, and 3 are non-REM stages, non-rapid eye movement. And that's really important for the body. So this is when all that physical repair is happening. And mm. so this typically happens in the first half of the sleep period. So for athletes, it's really important that you know they get this. Um, the second part then, are the, and predominantly in the back end of the night, is roughly between, we'll say, 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. Now, I keep referring to a typical night's sleep as from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. However, okay. I know that lots of people are shift workers that have alternating schedules. There's a whole host of things, but I'll keep anchoring my, my, my answers to that, and we may go off on, on different variations from that for shift workers. But the back end of the night, roughly between 2 and 7, is where we predominantly have more REM periods of sleep, and this is really important for that recovery, we'll say, of the brain, it kind of it, it's really important for cognitive processing the next day, reaction time, decision making, all of these things. Then is half at this this point. <laughs> now, many people may have wearable devices, and you see sleep stages happening. Those those wearable devices are highly inaccurate, and also as well, even if they were one hundred percent accurate, we can't force our bodies the next night to go. So we can't close our eyes before sleep and go right tonight. I'm just going to get more N3. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's no way to for us to action it. The body will prioritize what it has to has mm. to have every night. So it's very difficult for us to do it. So what we always advocate is that people allow enough sleep or enough time for the sleep. Mm -hmm. So I always say, like, if you want eight hours of sleep, you should spend nine hours in bed. That mm. allows for a bit of time to wind down, fall asleep. You're going to have a few awakenings across night, which is normal. So if you're going to go eight hours, allow nine. If you want nine hours, go at 10. Just add an hour and that gives you your time in bed, which is different mm -hmm. than your sleep duration. So that's roughly what's kind of happening in those phases of sleep. And each are important for different reasons. However, if you have sleep deprivation, the body will always, or the human will always prioritize REM sleep first. Hmm. This is why some people when have gone through sleep deprivation, um, maybe military, ultra running, um, things like this, um, or where sleep deprivation has occurred, they will have what's called REM rebound. So in the first portion of the night, they'll have lots more REM sleep. If we were to look at their sleep architecture in a laboratory, they would have lots of REM rebound or have crazy dreams. And so you may have experienced this when you've gone through a bit of bad sleep. Then you have a really good night's sleep. And you're like, wow, I had the craziest dreams last night. I dreamt I was, you know, born in Hong Kong. I dreamt I was an actor, whatever it might be, right? So all <laughs> these things might come up. And this is, this is because of REM rebound. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And so talking about the the priority of the REM sleep over, did you call it N3 was the deep, deepest? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we think about N1, 2, and 3 as the three <laughs> levels of non-REM sleep, and mm -hmm. N3 is the deepest, but okay. then we'll, we'll gen generally prioritize REM over those three stages. Okay. And so if the brain or body or brain is prioritizing REM sleep, if you haven't gotten lots of sleep, is that so in the, you're saying REM is where a lot more of like, did you say like the cognitive processing yeah. gets yeah. kind of like flushed out versus deep tissue recovery, muscle repair is going yeah. on. So the, the body is prioritizing to benefit that brain functioning over muscle initially, repair. Initially it will. Yeah. Because it's like, so the other way I kind of say this and scientists probably will roll their eyes at me doing this but i think it's important for us to try and communicate these concepts out to the general population in an easier way and so the one i like to use is that rem sleep is updating the software and non-rem is updating the hardware so think about mm -hmm. your phone mm -hmm. think about your phone every few years I need to get a new phone i have to get new yeah. hardware mm -hmm. but i can do these ios updates for an apple phone every so often so that's yeah. the way i kind of just try and get people to think about it as well that's so a good software idea. And, and hardware and so i'd always prioritize the software up there Mm -hmm. when you have lack of sleep. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And then kind of with those different stages of sleep, have you noticed through your research um, or with your clients or studies, certain things that impact those specific stages? Do they I like I increase or decrease them outside of not getting enough sleep and your body prioritizing more REM? So I'm going to answer that question by answering another question first, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, <clears throat> because we have different ways of measuring sleep. We've got PSG, which is polysomnography. This is this classic in laboratory sleep study. Then we have different levels of PSG we can use at home, levels two to four. As we go up those levels, two, three, and four, we have less channels and less kind of, I suppose, things we can look at. Okay. Then we move into the wearable phases, all this actigraphy stuff. 
And we've mm-hmm. re- I've re- uh, been involved in a paper with this where we've talking about the role of sleep tracking. I think it's called pajamas, polysomnography, um, self match or Amy Bender and a few others. Then we move into the actigraphy phase, which is all the wearable devices like your Fitbits. And then we move into like using apps to self-report um, or diaries and so on. So think about it three ways. Polysomnography, wearables, self-report. Self-report, obviously, highly skewed, highly variable. Wearables, a little bit better, probably 80 to 90% good at doing it. And then PSG is the best. However, okay. PSG is very expensive. It takes 45 minutes to set someone up. you got to bring them to a lab or go to their home. It's highly intrusive. It's not repeatable. It's very difficult. Mm. There is hardly any studies done on athletes using PSG. There's probably less than 10. Oh. Wow. So it's very hard to know what the sleep architecture of, of, of athletes are. It's yeah. very, very difficult. To my knowledge, currently, I have the only study in the world that's actually looked at the top level, level one PSG study, mm-hmm. looking at the prevalence of sleep problems and disorders wow. in elite rugby players. I think that's wow. the biggest study still today that was published in 2018. Wow. Very, very few people. Now, outside of that, I have done some PSG with elite level athletes Mm -hmm. in different sports, Formula One, Major League Baseball, rugby, and so on. What what impacts those stages? What's really evident is, one, alcohol. That's We see that clearly. Mm -hmm. It will help people fall asleep or will disrupt the sleep architecture across the night so they keep waking up, Mm -hmm. even though they may not remember. Two, um, the prevalence of a sleep disorder. So there's over 70 recognized sleep disorders by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine that we follow here. The most prevalent one being obstructive sleep apnea. Mm. Now, a lot of people will probably know that that's related to body weight. So basically, the fatter or bigger you are, the more prevalence you have of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're a male and you're over 40 and your body mass index is over, I think, 30 or 31, Mm. you've got a 95% chance of having obstructive sleep apnea. But there's also 60 odd more sleep disorders you may have. So what I've seen as well in athletes, independent of their body size, that sleep apnea still occurs. Mm. And particularly on their back, we call it positional or supine sleep Mm. apnea. So many athletes have a sleep disorder, even though they're fit and healthy. And on paper, they look like they're hitting all the metrics, body fat, strength, top of their game, making millions of dollars, but they still have a sleep disorder and they may not even know it. Yeah. Wow. But this, this is impacted as well. And the other one I've seen as well, um, more in recreational athletes is, and this sometimes happens in combat sports. I think it actually happens a little bit in endurance running as well. I haven't partaken Mm. in that is the use of marijuana. Mm. So people will often advocate, advocate, oh, marijuana is great. It helps you sleep. It's great for pain. Yada, yada. That's great. There's many people out there listening to popular podcasts today where they advocate marijuana use. The challenge with marijuana is that it suppresses REM sleep. Mm -hmm. And so long-term marijuana smokers will then have REM rebound for Mm. months on end. Wow! If you get a guy that's been smoking marijuana for five years plus, just recreationally or just for sleep, when they come off for six months, it'll be like they're tortured. They'll be like, my head is going to explode. These crazy dreams. I need to go back smoking weed. So I think think drugs and alcohol is what we really see being impacted on on sleep Mm -hmm. architecture. And then... Um, uh, the prevalence of a sleep disorder. And then finally, we would say what's called social jet lag, where Mm. there's variation in time to go to bed. And this is a big problem, not for athletes, but for the general population alike, because we're so busy these days. Yeah. And I think if you have recreational athletes listening to this podcast, they would definitely attest to this. They're trying to work a full-time job. They may have kids. They're trying to get their training in. And so their bedtime is very variable and their wake time is very variable. The more variation you have in the time of sleep onset and the time at wake the next morning when you get up, the more chance you're going to have of disruption to your sleep. And so when we start looking at that, we call that social jet lag. So people may be going to bed one night at nine o'clock at night, getting up the next morning at five to go maybe cycling. And then they go, right, well, t- the next night now I've got to go to a function or an event. It's Friday night. They stay up to maybe midnight. And then... They go to bed, but then they go, oh, it's Saturday morning. I need to get up and go for my run because I'm a triathlete. So they get up at six and then they try and get a nap during the day. And they just are constantly just out of cycle and they're not really prioritizing sleep. Yeah. And so we see we see this impact as well on sleep architecture of people. And then also on the uh, with the wearables, it's really pronounced because we can track them long term mm. and we can just see lots of variation. Um, and this is a kind of a, a theme that will come out of today's conversation to manage sleep is actually pretty simple, but it's pretty boring, right? So what we're okay. looking for is variation. Yeah. 
want it's the old like that Jocko Wilnick has a military podcast and history stuff and he's it's true discipline mm-hmm. equals freedom and there, and and it is so true that if we just get disciplined with a lot of these things we will mm-hmm. then have the the ability to recover and do things and this is why for me at the age of 45 people would say how do I train jiu-jitsu how do I train like um how do I like swim these 20, 10 20 k swims and I go because my life is born and I've cut out alcohol and I go to bed nearly every night between nine and half nine, and I get up between half five and six every morning. So it's pretty routine, no matter where mm-hmm. I'm going or what I'm doing, because I need that stability and that bedrock to be able to perform upon that. But most people don't do that to prioritize their training. If they're a triathlete, a triathlete they want to like swim, run, bike, maybe do some weights, get a massage, um, you know, put a tens machine on, put some sort of moon boot on or some boot thing to, and then they're like, right, I've got everything done now, I'm going to go to bed. But it should be the other way around because the base yeah. of the recovery pyramid is sleep. And I've said this on numerous podcasts, and numerous things is that if I charged you for sleep, you'd probably do it. Mm-hmm. But you want to, you want to, people want to externalize all the recovery by, oh, I went and had massage. I went to a physiotherapist. I went to an osteopath. I went here. I went there. How about we just focus on routine first and sleep and see yeah. how much performance or increments we can get from that? Yeah. I, long, I mean, I 100% long, long agree. Way, long answer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love all of that. I remember um, one of the, um, do you follow SCAN, Sports Cardiovascular and Wellness Nutrition Academy no. out of the United States? They do annual conferences. And I remember one of the ones I went to, there was, I can't remember who it was because it was like 10 years ago, but I remember there was a sleep speaker and she, her first slide was like, if I told you in a pill, I could give you like all these things. Yeah. And it, th- she's like, would you take it? And everybody's like, yeah. And then the next slide was like, great. It's sleep. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I totally get that. I have a couple questions about those kind of four things you were talking about. So marijuana, you mentioned, do we know if this is purely smoking versus like a CBD cream, or do we know if it's CBD versus THC that's contributing to that? Yeah, that's a good question. So now I'm not an expert in this area, but um, one of my uh, colleagues at the University of Western Australia, Jennifer Walsh, has just ran some research, has just conducted research on this recently in the last few years and published. And she was on the podcast recently talking about okay. this. So in general, and I might be getting this wrong, but um, which I usually do, <laughs> in general, you've got CBD, which mm-hmm. you just alluded to, and THC, THC mm-hmm. being the psychoactive component. So CBD on its own is is good in terms of medicinal wise that'll help with muscle soreness relaxation and so on mm-hmm. the thc is a psychoactive part there has been jennifer did some trials on um looking at i think it was a, a tablet where with mainly with cbd but it had a small trace of thc in it mm. but it wasn't enough to make people have psychoactive sort of hallucinations or, or activity whatever you want to call it um, and that was proven to show that it would help people with clinical insomnia. Now, to get oh, yeah. diagnosed as clinical insomnia, it takes about three months. Wow. I think the problem is, Kyla, is that people are hearing CBD and THC and are using them interchangeably. Mm-hmm. And so I've been to mining companies and guys are telling me that their doctor told them to smoke a joint. I'm like, that is not what they said. They said, maybe you want to consider <laughs> CBD. Yeah, right. smoke a joint. I'm like, no, yeah. CBD oil or tablets or creams or whatever is completely different than sitting down and sparking up you know, a joint. That's that, that's right. not what we're talking about. Yeah. There, there, there's no, I think all, the only place that I've heard about full scale, say CBD, THC is probably end of life people. Yeah. That's yeah. where I think it's it's only been prescribed mainly. That's that's my only, my knowledge of that area. But you're right. CBD and CBD is the key term here. Not a joint is, is shown to have benefit mm. on athletes. Um, and people with sleep problems and sleep disorders. Again, there's a lack of research in this area. Mm-hmm. Some of the research around CBD and athletes is self-reported. So when I spoke about PSG, actigraphy, and self-report, mm-hmm. you're getting studies coming out going, yeah, nine out of 10 athletes, you know, said to sleep better. It's like when you sit right. down at night and you're watching, you know, TV and a commercial comes on and it's like some lady swaying her hair around for Vidal Sassoon. And down the bottom, mm-hmm. it says nine out of 10. The studies have shown that, you know, Vidal Sassoon helps your hair be stronger, longer, shinier, and better. And then you read the fine print, nine out of 10 women said that Vidal Sassoon was the best. It's a self-reported study, you know? Yeah. And this is where we need to look a bit deeper behind some of the research that comes out and mm-hmm. the spin that comes out in magazines and popular culture as well, because um, if it's just self-reported, then we have to start asking ourselves, and I don't want to go on a crusade here, a crusade here on scientific research, but then we yeah. have to ask ourselves, were the people incentivized, were they paid, who funded it, yada, yada, yeah. which is always a, a complex thing, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've seen a lot of that over the last few years. So, um, 
we just need to be mindful of that as well when we look at these studies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The type of study and, and who was looked at in the study, was it rats? Was it humans? Was it? Yeah. I think all of that's yeah. really important. And, and, to... and, and that's something that's really key. You just, you just pointed on that hit on that on the head as well. I, we hear lots of people talking on, on human performance physiology podcasts about what might happen, but they're predominantly quoting or referencing rodent studies. Yeah. And these are great for laboratory and we think this may be happening, but until we start doing studies in the field and 80 to 90% of my research is actually in that kind of actigraphy and self-report phase. Mm. So not in the lab. What's mm -hmm. happening out there? Can we get this like ecologically validated data out there? What's happening with shift workers being away for two or three months? Right. Can we measure those in the field? Can we look at athletes long-term um, and see what's happening? That's really yeah. what I'm interested in, not the yeah. lab-based studies. Lab-based studies are good and important, but the more real-life data we can collect, the better it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that, and that's always so hard, right? Cause there's so many variables with the exactly. real life. So yeah. And, um, and, and, and sorry, just on that Kyla as well, a lot of people would, would, would say as well, like, and this is why I, I advocate now for younger people when they say, should I study sleep? I go, no, go and do engineering because in engineering, you've got a system, you've got mm -hmm. inputs, you have a process and generally the outputs will be the same and you can tweak them slightly with different variables. Mm -hmm. As you know, biology, things like diet, nutrition, sleep performance you got humans its inputs are the same some crazy process happens and the outputs are all over the place it's like drawing lines with a crayon it's like a kid on the wall sometimes when you graph our data from like what is going on that is like a kid just drew lines everywhere mm -hmm. on an excel sheet and this is what happens humans do not always behave the same so yeah. whilst i'll talk about general stuff today there may be tweaks for individuals that not everybody's going to behave the same Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And all, and all the studies too, there's always, I mean, for the most part, there's usually some outlier liars going on there, even on, you know, in our human population as well. Yeah. So. And that's why it's important to leave those in, I think. So a lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of, a lot of statisticians would say, take out those outliers. I'm like, no, let's leave them in because that's how people behave. And there'd be right. lots of variation based upon age as well, gender, yeah. body weight, ethnicity, cultural yeah. backgrounds, all different things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. So we, we covered the THC marijuana CBD situation. Um, the fourth one you mentioned was remind me it was sleep apnea, sleep, uh, you said sleep, the sleep apnea. So and I said alcohol, disorder. alcohol and drugs, social jet lag. Oh so, yeah. yes. Social jet yeah. lag. Okay. So yeah. my question there was, is there a certain range that you recommend not changing your sleep window, like outside of meaning, um, if you normally, well, say you go to bed at nine one night, 11 another night, should you try and keep it within 15 minutes of like the 9 p.m. window or an hour? Do you have a suggestion? So I'm going like, to be like a politician here again, Kyla. I'm going to answer the question I wish I was asked, not the question I was asked, but I will come back to your question on that <laughs> okay. about the social jet lag because it's important before we answer that one to understand chronotypes. Mm. So chrono meaning time and time mm -hmm. types. Now, classically, these are broken into three three groupings. Larks, those who like to get up early and go to bed early. Mm -hmm. Intermediates, kind of in the middle, as it says, these are our classic kind of go to bed at 11, get up at 7. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the, the owls who like to go to bed really late and get up late. Typically, we see this change over age as well. Mm. You'd see very young kids getting up, like, you know, three or four-year-olds getting up very early in the morning, going to bed early. Mm -hmm. um, the owls would be more like the teenagers. They want to stay up later and then get up later. And so it's important to know that there's different types of chronotypes in society and not everybody is the same. So people mm. will have kind of over the last few years think, think that like if you get up early, it's good. So getting up at five o'clock in the morning is not good for everybody. Right. right. There's so many different variables to have to take into account. What we want is consistency and routine like you two are alluding to. So depending on the variation of the sleep onset time. So I give an example later on if someone goes to bed at nine o'clock, then another night at 12 o'clock, then another night at, you know, half 10, whatever it might be. That's a kind of a three hour skew. Yeah. So the first thing I would look to do is probably knock out about 50% of that. So I might mm. go from someone who's fallen asleep between nine and 12, instead of going, you have to go to bed at nine o'clock every night. They're not going to do it. I'll say, all right, Kyla, what I want to do is give you a range and I'm going to bring you down into a range. I want you to go to bed between half nine and 11 every night for the next seven nights. And then I would look and see what that is. And then I would look to bring it down further again and keep titrating it. But that's going to be a conversation with you as well, because you might say, look, on Tuesday night, I actually go to this like 
um, sewing club and we do sewing till 10 o'clock. On Wednesday night, I have book club. And on Thursday night, I'm actually a Muay Thai, Muay Thai kickboxer and I don't go to bed till this. So I'd be like, right. So the variation is, is all this. So maybe your window of opportunity is going to be up to an hour or even 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. But what I want you to do is fall within that range. Amanda might be like, you know what? I train at lunchtime every day. I do, um, you know, body attack at, at a local gym and I don't need to stay up and I got no kids and, I, and my life's great and I can just play a PlayStation. So mind about behavior. So I might say to Amanda, Amanda, I want you to go to bed every night between nine and half nine. And so, so her lifestyle might be able to do that. But what we're looking for is consistency within that range. We want to keep titrating and bringing it down. And the same then with the time at wake the next morning. We've had this thing over the last three to five years, particularly driven from podcasts, is like, get up early, crush the day. You know, while they're sleeping, I'm working. Well, guess what? While they're sleeping, they're recovering and you're out wrecking yourself. Mm-hmm. And so we need to be mindful of what we're actually training from, what we're trying to do. The classic one is, and I've had this being said to me and I've said it for years as well. It's absolutely idiotic. Someone who trains to be a boxer and typically boxers compete at nighttime. Mm-hmm. Why are you getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go running? And a guy said to me, because I saw it on Rocky. Rocky is a fictional movie, <laughs> right? By a guy who was never a professional boxer. And this is what's happening. Podcasts, YouTube clips, advertisements for different clothing brands are getting people to do these stupid behaviors and people are doing it. Yeah. So if I'm a shift worker and I'm working the night shift, getting up at four or five o'clock in the morning to go cycling is probably not the best thing for me when my body really needs to be in these periods of REM sleep between two and seven. Mm -hmm. And if my chronotype is an out chronotype and I didn't go to bed till midnight, I've only got about four or five hours sleep. So guess what? I'm behind straight away. So this is where I have to look at all these variables together. And sometimes when we sit down with people, they kind of go, oh, this is actually really simple. Yes, it is. Because people get skewed by trying to do things that they think is the right thing. Yeah. It's not, not everybody has to get up early. So I don't care about the time you go to bed. What I care about is the variation. Kyla, yeah. if, you were an, if you were an old chronotype and you didn't go to bed until 2 o'clock every morning, I wouldn't care. Yeah. But then I want to see that you're sleeping in maybe till half nine or 10 the next morning. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Consistency is what I'm looking for. Consistency. Yeah. So we talked about consistency. What about suggested duration? Because every I think everybody's heard the eight hour recommendation. Yeah. I've seen other like I've seen 10, 12 hours for some of the like professional athletes clocking that much just from an like an observational perspective. Is yeah. that necessary? So my dad said to me when I was younger, when I would come in and say, Oh, dad. Johnny down the road has gone to America for a month and Johnny's going to Disneyland. He would say to me, uh, Ian, believe less of what you hear and more of what you see. So I would be weary of a lot of these reports that are coming mm. out on the internet as well about people sleeping 10, 11, 12 hours every day. If I had an athlete sleeping 10 to 11 hours every single day, I would think there was something wrong. Yeah. Because 95% of people are going to need between seven to nine hours of sleep a night. So when we draw a bell curve of sleep, it's somewhere in around there. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to have some people going to need a, bit, a little bit less and some people need a little bit more. Now, post-competition, post-heavy training, yes, they might be getting that. Maybe they're getting it in two sleep periods, which is called biphasic. Maybe they're having a little nap after lunch as well. Mm-hmm. So maybe they are getting it. But I don't know if they're consistently getting it. I haven't seen that in published research. Mm-hmm. And some of the research that talks about sleep extension and performance is self-reported research. So think back to the PSG, the wearables and the self-report. Mm-hmm. So yeah. how much evidence is in it? And what is what part of that sleep, what part of that time is actual sleep and what is just like right. rest? Now, the yeah. rest is very important. I'm, I'm not saying it's not. So maybe it's only eight and a half to nine hours sleep and another period is rest. So we need to kind of take those with a bit of a pinch of salt as well to mm-hmm. see what's happening. In general, and we've just formed a group called SHARP, Sleep Health Athletic Research um, Project, Ooh. where we have about 25 researchers from around the world. And so I've started this myself about two months ago, where we've had about 25, maybe a bit, maybe up to 30 now, um, sleep and sport experts around the world and we're getting together to look at all this work together because it's now been like 14 years of research we want to start looking at data harmonization where can we start publishing reviews where can we look at what's happening but typically i would say that the elite level athlete is probably achieving somewhere between six and a half and seven and a half hours sleep a night from all the studies Hmm. that's objective published studies not from you know xyz athlete on men's health or some other journal, some other, you know, health magazine says they're doing this. Yeah. So it's very hard to kind of quantify exactly what every athlete needs. We we can see that the, the athletic sleep is quite low based upon a number of factors, time of competition, um, time of training, 
external factors are the semi-professional, professional, um, all these other things as well. But what we do know and what's coming out in the sleep research area is that it's it's okay to have variation in sleep time. And so, sorry, sleep duration, not timing, but but sleep time. Mm-hmm. Sorry, sleep duration. I keep saying time. Sleep duration. So one night you might get seven or eight. Next night might be six and a half, then nine. And that variation is not too bad. The key we should be looking at now from the latest research is sleep quality. Mm. So how good was that sleep? So for example, last night I went to bed <clears throat> at nine o'clock and got up at four or six tomorrow this morning, but I had a terrible night's sleep. Mm. I fell asleep and then I woke up an hour later because I was too hot. And I thought I could sleep with a fan. I woke up an hour later. I was really hot. I could hear my heartbeat in my head. I went down, put on the air con. It took me about an hour and a half to get back to sleep. Mm. And then I woke up at half four this morning because I didn't I didn't control my sleeping environment adequately. Mm-hmm. So I had a long time in bed, but I had low sleep duration. But I'd set, if I was to report that sleep quality was pretty bad. Whereas yeah. the night before, it's brilliant. I got up feeling like Superman. So yeah. sleep quality is a better indicator as well. Now, I also do some research in dreams. Mm-hmm. And so we're analyzing the data set on this at the moment. We're, we're writing up about four or five papers. We just did a big study looking at dreams, debt, anxiety, and religious practice. Oh, interesting. And in, in this area as well, we know that sleep quality is also linked with nightmares. So when people have good sleep quality, they have lower nightmares. Okay. Lower nightmares generally then leads to better daytime functioning, less anxiety, and better overall mental health. So how do we solve that? For sleep quality, how do we solve that? So there's numerous things you can do. One, you can have that consistency of time to go to bed and time you get up. Mm -hmm. So be boring and be consistent. Two, you can pay attention to your physical health in terms of your body size and your body mass. And if you have a potential sleep disorder, whether it be obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, you should get that assessed, diagnosed, and treated because mm-hmm. this will help as well. Uh, pay attention to your sleep environment, like I was saying. So have a have a cool, have a dark, have some good airflow in it as well. The other thing you can look at is your alcohol consumption. So alcohol consuming alcohol before bed and the effect that has or other drugs like marijuana. <clears throat> the other one is caffeine. So many people over consume caffeine in our society today to stay alert to try and get things done. But if you consume caffeine after 2 p.m., you're generally going to have sleep issues if you go to bed at 10 p.m. We also need to consider other sources of caffeine because a lot of people would sit down and go, yeah, I don't have any coffee in the evening. I have one glass of red wine and I have some chocolate. But dark chocolate has a very high concentration of caffeine in it, as does milk chocolate, a bit less, and then white chocolate will have none in it as well. So if you're having lots of dark chocolate, you might have caffeine. So let's look at those caffeine sources as well. So these are some of the things we can do to help um, our sleep quality. Unfortunately, many people go, right, well, my day is over. And they think of it like a yin and yang cycle. So the, the white's over, the, the, the daylight period. Now with sleep, I just think about sleep. Whereas really, you should be thinking about sleep right from the morning you wake up. Because mm-hmm. the other thing you can do as well is, and studies have shown this as well, and it's been on other podcasts, but some like research, call researchers down here in Australia, over in Melbourne, Sean Kane. Uh, Angus, um, can't even his nickname, maybe Angus Burns, um, some of these guys, Andrew Phillips, they've actually found by looking at big data sets out of the UK Biobank that if we get 20 to 30 minutes of natural sunlight in the mm. morning or during any time during the day, really, is that that would actually help entrain our suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is our, our little timing chip in our head, if you want to call it that, will actually help with our sleep that night. Awesome. So your daytime activity, think about the yin and yang cycle feeding into each other. Your mm-hmm. daytime activity is just as important as your nighttime. You can't kind of go lying in the sand. It's nine o'clock, time for bed. Now I'll do all my 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 sleep stuff. You have to think about during the day. So yeah. one is feeding into the other constantly as well. So there, these kind of tips is what we call sleep hygiene. Mm-hmm. So like I was talking about the environment, the caffeine, alcohol, um, you know, drug use, nutrition, um, solving your sleep disorders. Um, having a routine, all of these things are really important to to basically help with sleep quality over time. Yeah. Talking about the sleep disorder piece. Yeah. Ha- is it very obvious if you are someone who maybe sleeps alone to know if you have sleep apnea? Not if you, not if you sleep alone. So with sleep apnea, for example, which is probably the most prevalent one in Western society, we see these rates going up in Australia, Western Europe, and in the US. 
because unfortunately what we've seen is probably since the 70s and um you know um from you guys doing nutrition and dietetics have noticed as well that body mass has increased significantly since the 1970s but what's tracked with that as well as that as body mass has gone up and i think it was the labo university of chicago evan cowder um, her laboratory has looked at this where the tracked like from the 70s body mass or body body weight's gone up sleep mm. duration has gone down type 2 diabetes has gone up and obstructive sleep apnea has gone up as well mm. so it's getting worse yeah um and that's having this vicious cycle because we know then with leptin and ghrelin levels you know it's it's going to control people aren't able to control their hunger they're eating more they're gaining more weight they're getting more Sever the severity of the OSA is getting worse. Mm -hmm. And so for someone on their own, it's going to be very difficult. So I would say your first measure is how do I feel the next day? And I would say for anybody out there, if your body mass index, and it's a very crude measure, body mass index, we know this, but if your body mass index is over 30, mm. you should, and you're feeling tired, you should be getting something, you should be getting some sort of assessment on this. Now going to your GP and having a conversation about sleep medication is not the way to go. So many people go, yeah, I got sorted. The doctor's giving me meds. Sleep medication is only effective for 10 nights. After that, it wears off. Oh, when we, when we take away sleep meds and give people a placebo, no difference. Wow. The other thing is long-term studies with melatonin. And many people start taking melatonin thinking it's a sleeping tablet. It's not, it's hypnotic. It may actually make your sleep worse depending on what time you take it. And if you're a shift worker, what we need to, what we need to do is, is focus on the actual sleep disorder. So you need to be going to like a sleep and respiratory physician or getting one of these overnight assessments where they put all these wires in your head, this polysomnography mm -hmm. on your chest to see if you have a sleep disorder. Because in, until you address that, you'll never make any headway into this. Yeah. Yeah, but that's only one of that's only one of over seventy disorders. Then we've got right. all these other ones related to shift work, insomnia. We got parainsomnia. We got people sleepwalking, sleep talking. We got people having REM behavior disorder, acting out their dreams. And um, then we got oh. a whole host of ones in pediatrics as well that happen when people are young, which they generally grow out of. Hmm. So there, there is lots of them. Yeah, and they're they're actually getting they're all getting worse in society because we are I, we are getting unhealthier really. Yeah, we, yeah. we think we're getting healthier. We're not, and we see this as well. There's um. There's another, um, I don't know if you've seen a paper that came out of Lancet a couple of years ago called The Value of Dying. It's a 50 page document that came out oh, wow. and had like uh, maybe 30 odd people involved in the writing of this. And it was like from, you know, physicians, researchers, psychologists, clergy people, religious people. The life expectancy in the US has gone back. So it's gone back by about two years, it's stagnant in Australia and stagnant in the UK. So we think in society, well, that's all kind of crappy and because we're living longer. We're not. Yeah. We're, we're, we're actually not. We're actually going backwards. Despite all our advances in medical care, we're going backwards. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah. So huh. we, need to take, we need to take ownership of our own health and not externalize mm -hmm. it um, in terms of medications or, you know, I go to bed at these different times. That's just how life is. We need to take back ownership of these things, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned melatonin. Yeah. Is there a time or place for that with regards to time zone travel? Time did I say that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost thought I just said time travel. I think I'm getting ready for bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, jet lag. And I think too, you probably have to explain the difference of travel is it travel fatigue versus jet lag? Is yeah, so we actually published two big papers on this. One was a systematic review led, led by Christa van Rensburg out of South Africa. And then we, on the back of that, we actually developed a consensus statement uh, because there was such little research on this. And these two papers are freely available, open access. We will include um, And they got some nice guides in the back of them as well around melatonin and timing to give mm. you some idea about it. Great. Um, but you're right. Travel travel fatigue is, is um, tiredness that results in traveling in the same time zone. So if I go from Vancouver to LA, same time zone, a couple of hours on a flight, I might be tired from getting up early and getting on the flight and dealing with the whole hassle of going through LAX and immigration in Canada. And, you know, by the time I get to my destination, it's half a day and I feel a bit tired. That's travel fatigue. Mm -hmm. and jet lag is when we start crossing, um, you know, go east to west, west to east for time zone, time zone travel, as you said, not time travel. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, no, mm -hmm. I like time travel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely go back in time. I can tell you yeah. that. Um, 
<clears throat> and so when we go across these different time zones, this is where we have what's called uh, jet lag. And this is like that social jet lag because it's variation and it's different mm-hmm. times about when we get light and dark cycles to us. And it kind of makes us completely discombobulated, to use a scientific term. In general, going east is more difficult for us to adapt and going west is easier. So every time you cross a time zone in an easterly direction, on average, it's going to take you up to a day to get used to that time zone. So I think between LA and New York is three hours. Mm-hmm. So that may take you up to three days, but coming mm-hmm. back from New York to LA may only take you a day and a half to get used to it. Interesting. Yeah. So that's in in general. Mm-hmm. Melatonin okay. can be used, but you got to take it at different times. And so when oh. um, I can't really give you a, 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 I can't give you an answer and says it has to be at the, like you know every two hours or every three hours, wherever it might be. But it's general. So sometimes, like I think going eastwardly, you might even though you want to go to bed at like eight o'clock mm-hmm. or nine o'clock, nine o'clock at night, you mm-hmm. might take melatonin at like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, and this is why I say about people kind of taking melatonin will often get it wrong because they think it's just like a sleeping tablet and they'll pop it like an hour before to go to bed. Mm. But that actually may make it worse for you. Mm. And so in the back of um, that consensus paper, we do actually have some little infographs or little kind of pictures that help um, people kind of make a look at the timing for that. Yeah. Okay. We'll so, li- we'll link that in the show notes too for our listeners. Um, Cause yeah, I think that could definitely be a resource. That's interesting to take it, like you're saying around two. So you're trying to kind of front load it to get your melatonin. Sec- yeah. Uh, increasing in the brain and body. Yeah. It's actually, um, it might just be worth. Um, do you actually put visuals onto these? Um, we'll link the we whole paper okay. is what we'll do. Yeah. We we'll link the whole paper because this is a really nice graph here. If I okay. want to just share it with you for a second. Okay. Because Let I me... don't want to, I don't want to um, give you the wrong. Oh yeah. Share screen. <laughs> <laughs> And this might just help. And if anybody's, if you're putting out the. Um... Perfect. So it has this beautiful infograph down the back. Okay. That shows about when you're going like west. Mm-hmm. Oh, neat. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and zoom in here. That's cool. For our people who are listening, you should definitely check out the YouTube video, but we will link this paper in the show notes as well. This is. Why can't, why can't I zoom in? What's happened here? Never let I... me. I don't know. Oh, you heard this. Oh, Oh, there we go. go. So yeah, yeah. So here you go. Like you see here, Mm -hmm. this little dot here is um, administer melatonin, practical advice. So you can see here. Interesting. Okay. You can see here, like this is like when you go eight hours east, Mm -hmm. you're taking melatonin just after midnight, Mm -hmm. just when you fall asleep. But here it's at eight o'clock, even though you're not going to bed till later on. So it depends on the timing. And I can, yeah. and so here, here's another one, like half seven at night. Mm-hmm. And so what we're doing when we're controlling, when we're jumping time zones, we're controlling light and dark cycles. So we might actually tell you to wear sunglasses at evening, as you can see here, because mm-hmm. you want to block out natural light because that's affecting the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So there's, you can see melatonin happening here. And this one here is even having melatonin happening after the first two hours of sleep. So whilst wow. this might be your sleep window, you might mm-hmm. have to, if, you, if you're still awake, you might take melatonin. And it's talking about the entrainment time as well. So this so graph is really is really nice. And this is freely available. It's an open access. You don't have to pay yeah. for this. Awesome. Um, so this will be helpful as well. And so you can see here, obviously, then you can see where the melatonin shifts. And then if you're going That's backwards so cool. or forward, east and west. So yeah. it's not always just taking it mm-hmm. right before bed. It might be at different times as well. The yeah. other thing to bear in mind as well, that for some people with other circadian rhythm disorders, such as um, shift work disorder or insomnia, Mm-hmm. The timing of that melatonin might be very, might be very different depending on the other factors as well. Right. And so, yeah, the other thing is melatonin in, in, in America, you can get it across the counter in three, five or 10 milligrams mm. here in Australia. It's prescription. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So it depends yeah. on the country. Yeah. So mm-hmm. a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of us, when we go to the States or Canada, are like get into the pharmacy and buy all the melatonin. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, yeah, so we, we could, we could, we, we uh, tend to do that. That's but funny. also as well, when it comes in supplementation form, uh, we're not sure what's in it um, right. right across the counter. So for anybody who may be subject to drug testing, mm-hmm. I would always recommend that you get it prescribed in case you uh, basically get done for any other sort of uh, yeah illegal substances that might be getting made with that that product. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's a great point. That's a great point. So <laughs> um, 
we have a couple of like questions that came from our listeners and um, one of them, I'll kind of start firing some of these off since we've, we've already been chatting for an hour. I know you said you give us an extra 30 minutes of your time. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that. So we'll try and get to some of these. Um, is there such a thing as too much sleep? In a very, very small percentage of people, too much sleep is bad. This is like another sleep disorder. Mm. But in general, for 99% of people, the body will sleep as much as it needs. Okay. And particularly for people who've been sleep deprived or may have been doing shift work for 20 years, they might be getting nine or 10 hours sleep for like up to a year, year and a half. Wow. Yeah. So a very small percentage of population will have problems with sleeping too much. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. less than 1%. Okay. Yeah. That's very interesting. And um, if we are getting enough adequate sleep, what would one note in terms of how, like how they might feel the next day? Yeah. So what's a good marker? So you wake up actually feeling refreshed. I wake up and go, oh, that was actually a good night's sleep. Now you're not going to mm -hmm. jump out of bed, you know, bouncing around every single morning, but maybe within 20 minutes, half an hour of, you know, you get up, you shower, you brush your teeth, you have a coffee, you go, oh, I actually feel pretty good today. Mm -hmm. The biggest marker will be, are you having daytime sleepiness? So mm -hmm. if you're sitting in a meeting, are you dozing off? Mm -hmm. um, independent of the content of it. Um, when you're stopped at a traffic light, are you dozing off? Yeah. In the afternoon between one and three, are you reaching for lots of sugary snacks? Mm. Are you looking for a stimulation because you're about to fall asleep? Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what I'd be kind of looking at is how am I, how my daytime, how's my daytime function? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's probably the easiest thing to look at. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, you kind of mentioned this, um, how sleep requirements potentially change from particularly maybe somebody in their thirties versus their sixties. Is there a big change there? Yeah, massive change. Yeah. So people will go through those different states. I uh, spoke about chronotypes like the larks, the owls, and so on. We generally see that teenagers obviously go more towards the owls than people mm -hmm. in their 20s will um, fall into kind of one of those categories. Mm -hmm. But then, as we see, as people get over 40, we see tendency back more towards larks mm -hmm. getting up earlier and earlier. And mm -hmm. um, this can be influenced as well by local customs and so on so for example here in perth in western australia it's a very we don't have daylight savings it's a very early morning city mm. if i go out to the beach at six o'clock in the morning swimming there could be 200 people under swimming up and down this one case stretch wow so, like yeah it's like we, we often joke it's like it's like a friday night at the beach at six o'clock some mornings you'll see people <laughs> swimming people stand up paddling boarding people and like little kayak things people running people cycling wow. the coffee shop might have like over 100 people in it it's like what is going on here wow. but 12 o'clock in the afternoon you know or two o'clock in the afternoon it's like a ghost town right so it, it will depend culturally on where you are yeah um so um what was the question again <laughs> how sleep how sleep changes from your 30s to your 60s <laughs> yeah I, got, I went off that tangent there um yeah because i was thinking about um sometimes you're going to that beach even at five o'clock in the morning there's mm. lots of older people in there you know paddling around because it gets bright so early mm. but um in general people will revert more back towards lark chronotypes so they'll get up earlier mm -hmm. and then um into their 60s and 70s they'll be super early this is why you see uh sort of nana and papa having a, a little and uh, nana nap in the afternoon as i say after lunch because they've woken up so early yeah and you'll see often older people in their 70s and 80s going to bed at like seven or eight o'clock at night so mm -hmm. you will see that gradual shift back so very early very late into one of these chronotypes and then back early as you go into your older age now the challenge is with that though for both male and female particularly over 40 you will start having more fragmentation of sleep Mm. You will start having more awakenings. You may have more discomfort as well through body pains, aches, injuries, and so on. And then for females getting into the menopause will cause mm. a lot of sleep problems in those different yeah. phases of the menopause as well. And so we have someone in our business that specializes in that, uh, Dr. Claire Ladyman. Awesome. Um, and she specializes in, in sort of pregnancy, fertility, and menopause. That her PhD was in that area. Cool. Um, but we see a lot of problems in that area. So women sort of generally between 45 to 55 having these having these challenges but men as well lots of frequent yeah. awakenings as well awesome well wow, that's really interesting um yeah. you mentioned napping so that's also one of our questions um can you nap too long yes so you can you can you can nap to, so to talk about this you need to think about three things behind this as well you got monophasic one sleep period you go to bed at 11 you get up at seven you got mm. biphasic you might sleep for six hours overnight and you have a nap in the afternoon classically like in latin based countries like spain that have mm. the siesta that's like mm -hmm. a biphasic culture and then you might have polyphasic which is 
people say like that Churchill and Einstein did this, you know, they would sleep maybe between three and six o'clock in the morning and have lots of little naps across the day. That's all good and well if you can get those naps because everything is going to add up to somewhere between seven to nine hours. Miss one of those naps and you're completely out of cycle. So when you nap, it's really important to recognize that um, napping will reduce what we call sleep pressure. So the longer we're awake during the day, the higher the sleep pressure is or the homeostatic drive for sleep. And so the only way to reduce that is actual sleep. So when we have a little nap, we reduce that. So if you want to have a nap during the day, just to get yourself refreshed, you should keep that to 20 to 30 minutes maximum. Mm. If you go longer than that, you're getting into deeper stages of sleep and mm-hmm. then you're going to impact your sleep at nighttime. So I, I, I come across lots of people that go, oh yeah, I only sleep for like four or five hours a night. And then you see they're having like a two hour nap during the day. You're actually getting seven hours of sleep in a 24 hour period. Yeah. You've got nothing wrong with your sleep. You've got no problem sleeping. You just have a biphasic approach to your sleep. Mm. So when we knock out the nap during the day, then we increase sleepiness and then end up sleeping seven to eight hours a day uh, overnight. Yeah. Okay. So nap, naps are fine. Keep them to 20 to 30 minutes if you're going to have them. If you have them every day, you are going to reduce sleep pressure overnight. Mm. So you need to be mindful. And if you miss them, it may make you feel worse that day. Mm-hmm. I would be for the most people in sort of what I call middle earth, middle age, middle life, probably having a nap or two on the weekends, probably all right, because it catches mm-hmm. up on any sleep that you may have had. But napping every day may not be practical for some people. The other thing as well for those people napping for performance based, if they're on endurance activities, doing mm-hmm. long distance running over days or these adventure racing and so on. Think about having what's called a nappuccino. Have you heard of a nappuccino? Like Is a that where you do the coffee and then go nap? That's exactly right. Because the pharmacokinetics of caffeine takes about 30 to 60 minutes for caffeine to hit your system. If you have that coffee first, have your sleep. When you wake up, the caffeine will help you get out of sleep inertia and give you a jolt and performance out of that as well. So I like that. That's something you could do it as well. Yes. But everything is yin and yang in sleep, right? Cause and effect. Both sides mm-hmm. of the ledger, like an accountant. If you sleep during the day, you're not going to sleep as much during the night. Yeah. yeah. If someone goes to lay down for a nap and they're laying there and they can't fall asleep, yeah. is, there, is there a certain duration where you're like, okay, it's been 15 minutes, it's been five minutes, like I'm not falling asleep, should I just not try a nap? Well, I, I think for people um, who we talk about this for people doing night shift work, transition onto their first night shift. We talk about mm. this for athletes. And I often do this as well. Today is Friday. I'm most likely going to do this this afternoon. I love doing this on a Friday afternoon around three or four o'clock. Um, I do this generally around three. I'll just go and lie down and I'll mm. read for a few minutes. If I fall asleep, mm. I fall asleep. Mm. And then I go and train jujitsu at 5 p.m. with a few of my mates. So it's a nice kind of end to the week. And then we get a, a takeaway myself and my wife. So it's kind of a nice wind down, but I like it. Yeah. It kind of gives me that space between work and then into the weekend. Yeah. And sometimes I just sit there and read. Other times I fall asleep. Other times I just lie there and listen to a podcast. Mm. So the rest period or the act, the, the what I, I call the, the the act of downtime, the like the act of act of um just lying there and resting is also mm-hmm. beneficial. Our lives are so busy. We never just kind of sit. Yeah. We never yeah. just like um, you know, I've been on a couple of these silent meditation retreats. And it's interesting when you go on them because you're like, oh my God, I just talk so much crap the whole time and move around and just constantly keep myself busy. I'm like a kid with ADHD. And when I sit in silence, it's like, oh, peace. Yeah. Those little little portions of peace are really important for us. Now that could be listening to something that makes you relaxed. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't actually seen any research on this. This is the study I'd like to do because some people go, is it bad to listen to the radio, whatever it might be? Mm. So if you're listening to a podcast and you've got someone like roaring and screaming in your ear about politics, that's probably not the most relaxing thing. But if you're listening to one of these like, you know, BBC podcasts or, mm. you know, someone reading Harry Potter or something like that, something that makes you like, I've got into history podcasts the last few mm. months. Mm-hmm. And I love listening to them because I get to about 10 minutes and I'm just going to sleep, particularly the the sort of um, middle class English guys. You know, there's a great yeah. one I listen to called The Rest is History. And there's two guys just talk about history. They never scream <laughs> or shout. And it's very, it's very civilized. Well, mm-hmm. well done, Mick. What was happening? Well, Lord Albert went out in the ship and he, got, and he was like, <laughs> and you're gone. And it's great. So use it. Use these things for a sleep edge, you know. Yeah. I know people actually listen to my podcast and they've told me this because my voice makes them fall asleep. That's the greatest compliment I ever got. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You're like their own melatonin. Yeah. Um, do, we, do you set an alarm for yourself when you go do your nap and yeah, podcast? I just set, yeah, I set a timer. Yeah. So yeah. when I'm when I'm taking a lie down or a nap, I set it for like basically about 30 minutes. Okay. I also know as well, this is another thing that people should look at is your time to fall asleep, right? Mm-hmm. So many people, this is another study I like to do because I think this might be related to um introverts versus extroverts or maybe some oh. personality profiling right i think this may be maybe something in this 
I see a lot of introverts, a lot of people who are very conscientious, steady type, don't want to deal with a lot of people, tend to fall asleep very quick. Mm. you got no problem. The people in that do lots of sort of extroverted work like myself or talking to people or dealing with lots of companies and running a business, it can take me up to an hour to fall asleep. So I have to do a process of reading, listen to a podcast and wind down. I can't just go bang and I'm asleep. My wife, she can go, good night. And she's gone. Like just instant sleep, right? Instant. <laughs> and always been like that. Always. Yeah. But me, no, the complete opposite. And so I think there might be something in this world. So understanding your time to fall asleep. So for me, my clock or timer would be 30 to 40 minutes because I know it's going to take me a good 10 to 20 minutes to wind down. Mm. And then I'll typically only get about 15 minutes of sleep and then I'll jolt back up anyway. So I generally wake up about two minutes before that timer goes off. Interesting. Yeah. Well, anecdotic, anecdotally, I will I will uh, verify what you just said because I do consider myself an introvert, even though I speak with clients all day and Amanda and podcast guests and, and I do fall asleep like, like that. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I put my head on the pillow at night, my, it is like, it's it, as an introvert, like you're using up your battery every time, right. That you are doing these things. So when I put my head down, I'm just lights out. Whereas my husband could like sit and read his Kindle for like an hour before he can yeah, fall yeah. asleep. He's very much an extrovert. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm. I think I'm. I think I'm an extrovert introvert. I don't mind uh, doing extrovert things. Yeah, but I need them to be left alone for a period of time because if yeah. I if I keep doing stuff over and over again, I just burn out and I'm just like yeah. I can't I can't deal with it. Then I do need these periods of retreat. Yeah, particularly the weekend is my retreat space because I do so much of this during the week and dealing with people mm -hmm. across the world and different things that when it comes to the weekend, I just want to be left alone. Yeah. <laughs> That's I'd why love I like to, swimming. I, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I no, totally nobody can talk to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's very meditative too with yeah. the breathing. Um, yeah. If you do that today, I'd love to, I'm so curious about what you find. Um, okay. So definitely want to be mindful of your time here since I know we're, we're cruising on this, but um, tools, tools to improve sleep outside of melatonin, blue light blocking glasses. I know that study mentioned like just straight up sunglasses. Are these like just standard sunglasses, just as good as blue light blocking glasses or, or do blue light blocking glasses work? <laughs> so this is, this is an interesting thing because people may have heard about the impact of electronic devices on sleep. Mm. Um, this is not conclusive despite what you'll read on things on the internet. Interesting. So we're actually myself and a guy called Russell Foster from Oxford, mm. um, Michael Granazar, who used to be at Flinders, and a few others are undertaking a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is like the top level of research you can do. Yes. Basically, we're pooling all the research that's ever been conducted on electronic devices and its impact on sleep. And we're taking all the data from those studies and we're looking at them combined. So it's like mm. taking all the data from different things and putting them into a big statistical package and looking at them and going, right, really what's happening here yeah. i can tell you i've been involved in two studies one in the lab and one in the field mm. no impact of electronic devices on on sleep performance in cognitive or physical yeah wow but you see the media will latch on to these things and we need to think about what's clinically relevant mm -hmm. and what's statistically significant right so the classic example i'll use here is that when we talk about sleep latency most people should be falling asleep between 10 and 30 minutes. That's kind of the clinical normative ranges. Mm -hmm. If Amanda goes to bed and she falls asleep in 29 minutes and you go to bed, Kyla, and you fall asleep in 11 minutes, if my maths is correct, we've got a difference there of about 18 minutes, right? Between the both of you. Are you both in the clinical norms? Yeah, because you said 10 to 30. Yeah. Yeah. Now... <laughs> If I take those those data points every single night and I put them down, well, someone just came up to my window. It's the guy reading the water meter. He frightened me. <laughs> <laughs> the water meter is right there. I was like, is he? It's the gas line. The gas meter's here. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, and I look at that data every night, maybe a month. So I've got 30 data points and you bought 11 and 29. If I run a T test between those, I'm mm. going to find a statistical difference, right? A P value of less than 0 0.05. So in my paper, I'd be like, there's statistical difference. Now, Amanda might be looking at, you know, Facebook or interacting on the Trump campaign or whatever it might be and getting all hyped up on that. You might be down to the end going, you know, I don't really care about politics, whatever it might be. This narrative of that study would be 
electronic devices impacts sleep because mm. we found a statistical difference of 18 minutes, but you're bought within the clinical norms. Mm. But however, you both might go to sleep. Amanda might get eight hours of sleep, but you might make, wake up 20 minutes across the night, Kyla, and then get six hours of sleep. So what's it really impacting? Is it impacting your time right. to fall asleep, your overall sleep, your sleep quality, your next day performance? So again, coming back to what I was saying earlier on, we need to be careful how we navigate and read these studies. Yeah. And unfortunately, in today's world, there's lots of clickbait, as we know. Mm -hmm. And so lots of people, this, this is a hook to get people to read articles and so on. And so yeah. there's actually no conclusive position on electronic devices and activity before sleep. Interesting. Which leads, leads me into your comment because, or your question, lots of people go, well, I have these blue light blocking glasses. But see, what may be affecting people more so is not the electronic devices. It might be the type of activity. Again, mm -hmm. I met a joke there about Amanda, maybe he's on the, the Trump campaign. But maybe she likes that. Maybe she's kind of, she loves all this stuff and it's great and it, and so on. But that might be making you very, very agitated, Kyla, if you read the same thing. Or if we go to bed and we're watching maybe an episode of Kardashians on our iPad, we might be laughing at that. And it's like, we don't care. That's going to yeah. make us fall asleep. And then other people might be, you know, Kyla, you might be doing a spreadsheet, looking at your finance for last month, going, oh my God, how am I going to afford next month? Mm -hmm. Amanda's looking at her spreadsheet and going, there's no problem here. So one's evoking stress and one's not. Yeah. So I think what's more important and we need to look at going forward in these studies is what's the type of activity we're doing before bed on these electronic devices and how much is that going to be stressful for people? Because that's yeah. what we need to look at is stress and, and the impact on cortisol levels for people. And so what will happen now is people are going, well, I bought these blue, lock, blue, blue blocking glasses. So everything's fine. Mm, mm -hmm. You're still going to be stressed if you're looking at a spreadsheet and right. you have enough money. You're yeah. still going to be stressed if you're looking at politics. Mm -hmm. And you may be stressed if you're looking at the Kardashians. I don't know. Like, but it all depends on what's a stressor for the for that person. Yeah. So these blue light block blue light blocking glasses may not be the best thing and it will not eliminate the, the stress. Mm -hmm. But if we're looking at just eliminating light, mm -hmm. sunglasses would be good when we talk about natural light. Mm -hmm. And the blue uh Glasses. Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not convinced yet. Like I'm, I'm yeah. just not convinced that these are an adequate mm, thing. Mm -hmm. I think we need to kind of go back and look at the root cause. What's mm -hmm. causing us distress? What's causing us to look at electronic device? Do we have to yeah. instead of trying to put a band aid solution on top of it? And this is the problem. Right. People are going. Well, I've done this and I've changed this. Like the stress is still there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's like saying, oh, you know, I'm really overweight, but you know, I got one of those things that holds the belly in. Mm. <laughs> so you're still fat. Yeah. A skims bodysuit <laughs> with the yeah. Kardashians that you're watching. <laughs> do they sell those? No, they what, do. what don't what what don't they sell? Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And then let's see, I'll kind of do some other, let's see, quick fire questions here. Um with regards to nutrition and potential supplementation and exercise. Um is it problematic to exercise too close to bedtime? C can it affect sleep? Quality. Yes, it can. And study, yeah. studies have shown that people who exercise up to three hours before bed mm -hmm. may have a difficulty falling asleep. Again, activity type. If mm -hmm. you're doing yoga before mm -hmm. bed, it may be conducive to good sleep. It may help you relax, like kind of right. in yoga, things like this, maybe Pilates or so on. But if you're going into and sparring in a boxing ring, mm -hmm. you're definitely going to be like two to three hours before you fall asleep. So again, yeah. type of activity. Also as well, think about, I would call it, is the arena. Mm. I'm a professional athlete playing in front of bright lights, nine o'clock at night, you know, and I'm all pumped up on pre-workout, which is full of caffeine. Right. So I'm definitely going to have impact effect on yeah. my sleep there. And we've seen this in some of my research as well, where people don't go to sleep till seven o'clock next morning mm -hmm. from it. Yeah. So it's, it's probably, yeah. The, the, I think the least we've seen was for a game to finish at nine, half nine at night, the earliest people went to bed was 20 past two in the morning. Oh, Wow. Yeah. That's in, that's in a rugby game. So it's a contact sport. Yeah. yeah. So you're, gonna, you're definitely going to see that. So you're going to have yeah. an impact to, um, to sleep timing. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then have you seen certain supplements benefit sleep? Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say directly on sleep. The supplementation area and the nutrition area and sleep is, is very sparse. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that people who exercise a lot, work in extreme environments, is that paying attention to things like magnesium levels. Mm -hmm. So people mm -hmm. who take supplementary magnesium, particularly mm -hmm. if they exercise a lot and work hard. Mm -hmm. has has people have self-reported those being beneficial mm -hmm. and then other things like um other drinks um that have potassium and sodium and then particularly in environments here like australia where people are kind of dehydrated 
particularly when oh, you're working yeah. in the, where it's like very hot, 40 mm-hmm. to 50 degrees Celsius. Um, yeah. So they 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 have been, they said they have uh, benefit in sleep from having these kind of sodium potassium type drinks as well in the evening. So things like the LMNT drink mm-hmm. um, or what I do see is probably more people having the more sugary type, you know, and I just think about like the power reds and the mm-hmm. energy drinks mm-hmm. and all these those people are having more sleep problems and gaining mm. a lot of gaining a lot of weight as well because mm-hmm. just having those extra calories that they don't need. Yeah, but yeah, I, I would say magnesium is probably the best one I've seen for people. Yeah, okay. and take it after after dinner with food before bed. Do not mm-hmm. take it on an empty stomach, or you will be going to the bathroom a lot. Yes, yes, especially with magnesium citrate, right? Yeah. Um, Okay. And then, um, with regards to nutrition, eating too close to bed or certain types of foods, um, in, outside of alcohol and caffeine, of course, um, have we, you seen anything that will impact and or benefit sleep? I have seen no definitive evidence. Um, there's mm-hmm. been a review, um, published a few years ago. We wrote a letter to the editor about some of the overstatement of the, of the recommendations. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Ronan Doherty in Ireland has looked at some of the stuff as well. He's looked at the impact of kiwi fruit on sleep. Oh, but again, that was, a, that. that was a self-reported study again. And, yeah. you know, Ron, Ronan's been on the podcast and spoken about that. And he's presented on our last sleep for, for performance seminar and discussing mm-hmm. that and the limitations with it. So um, it's very, very difficult to find out, you know, what really impacts people and and as you know in the diet nutrition area there's so much statements being made you know people are going oh, yeah. i went carnivore my sleep improved but is it because of inflammation you took out the sugar yeah. like, how, we don't know really know the cause and effect mm-hmm. but i would say in general a general rule for people is that eating too close to bed may make you feel full and uncomfortable yeah so i found myself personally playing around with it that if i eat between six and half six going to bed at nine to half nine perfect for me so i, yeah. I like this kind of two to three hour two hour minimum but three mm-hmm. hour window Mm-hmm. Many people who are busy, working, have kids, studying, training for uh, an event may not eat later at nine o'clock at night and then they're going mm-hmm. to bed feeling really uncomfortable. Yeah. So you may want to consider eating at different times or across the day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I've the the most pronounced research we've seen is alcohol and caffeine and nicotine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But outside of that, yeah, it's it's an absolute mess. And then there's a whole area of chronic nutrition emerging for shift workers as well. Uh, mm. Dr. Charlotte Gupta is doing some research in this as well. And again, lots of these studies due to cost and difficulty are self-reported. Right. So, yeah, still, yeah. Still, still yet to be kind of solved. And I know this is, isn't the ideal answer for a lot of listeners, but it kind of what I'm trying to shape here, what you've probably seen or heard over the last hour is that there's still a lot of work to do in this field and we do yeah. not definitely know how to manage this area. It's yeah. very, very new. Think about 2010. We've only mm-hmm. seen a kickoff in athletic research yeah. and nutrition and performance and so on in this, in, this, in this relationship. So still lots and lots to do and yeah. very little funding, if none at all, from the government. Mm. Yeah, I think, yeah. no, I think that's really important to share that. And I will say too, that like even nu- in nutrition, there's still so much that needs to be done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so- yeah. Um, yeah, nutrition may be worse than sleep because it's nearly, it's nearly like a religion. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I was thinking about you when I was thinking about nutrition too, because we always get the like, well, people who, well, I eat food. So I know how like to educate other people on nutrition. It's like, well, I sleep. So I know how to educate other people on sleep. So I'm sure you probably deal with a lot of that, but, um, (laughs) My one final question is um, with all the sauna talk and cold plunging talk, do yeah. either of one of those have a benefit or do they hurt sleep at all if done too closely to bed? So Elise Roby has done some work in this um, here at the University of Western Australia looking at cold plunge before bed mm. um, found no impact to sleep. Great. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Found no impact to sleep. I know for me personally in the winter doing mm-hmm. some sauna is nice. I like mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I'd be more I'd be more on the side of um heat. <laughs> yeah. Um I like that. And particularly as I get older, I think it's it just more aches and pains and different mm-hmm. things as well. I'm doing a combat sport. Yeah. And um, I spoke to Shona Halson. He used to work out, and Shona's been on a few papers. I mean, she's worked at the Australian Institute of Sport. She does a lot of stuff in this area as well. She said it's down down, they've not not really seen any definitive impact on sleep either. Mm. But um it comes down to personal preference as well. She said, like, you know, a lot of Polynesian people will not want to do the cold. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, but maybe, you know, Australians will. Yeah. Um, I've got no interest in the cold. I had enough cold growing up in Ireland, so I've got yeah. no interest in it as well. But the other thing people should think about as well is the difference between cold and hot as well, because I have seen a lot of people go, oh, I've done a really hard session at the gym and my goal is to get bigger. And then they've jumped in a cold plunge pool, whereas really 
that's actually going to inhibit the hypertrophy aspects that you're right. looking for. Yeah. So people should also kind of consider those things as well about what yeah. why you're doing hot or cold mm-hmm. and the timing of it as well. But in general, for most people, we have not seen, to my knowledge, unless something else come out recently, mm-hmm. um, any impact to sleep. Okay. Um, for those people. Awesome. Yeah. All right. What, 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 I, what I would say, though, independent of sauna and, and cold, I've probably seen more people have problems with sleep based upon environmental temperatures. Mm, so people mm-hmm. working in very hot environments and then yeah. not having um, a good sleep environment. So that's where I probably see some fragmentation and sleep yeah. for, for heat. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. I'll circle it quickly back to your two truths and a lie. So you said that you were born in Hong Kong. Your history teacher in high school said you should be an actor. And then you once ran for 28 hours. I thought your lie was the born in Hong Kong. Amanda said the run. Which which one was it? Born in Hong Kong was a lie. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you did run for 28 hours. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's... Um, but it, um, it's interesting because I do know a lot of Irish people who were born in Hong Kong. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. It's because, it was, because it was part of, it was only handed back, I think, in 99. Mm-hmm. And so lots of sort of middle, upper class Irish people that would have had dads in finance or account. So I stole that from somebody else that I heard. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah. So, so, awesome. so it was interesting. And your high school teacher did see see the actor qualities in you. It yeah. He, like. said, he, he said to me like uh, that I should... Um, I, sh- I, sh- I should go and be an actor. And I actually went to um, the theater in our my hometown and I was um, going to be in a play, but then it got canceled. And because I was playing rugby, had a part-time, I was playing lots of like rugby for different teams, had a part-time wow. job and I was involved in the scouts as well. I just didn't have enough time to go back for another play. Yeah. And um, yeah. And so I've never, I've never been, but interestingly enough, I've done a fair bit of media here in Australia, doing the podcast and all that. So there's probably little tentacles into that acting thing. Yeah. Um, and I've been involved in making a couple of TV shows and cool. documentaries behind the scenes. So it was, it, it, you know, there's, there's touches on it. And actual fact, after seeing it, I'm glad I wasn't an actor because shooting something for 14 hours that makes a five minute clip would abs- mm. drive me insane. It's a waste of time. <laughs> like, yeah. just wow. like, we've done that 50 million times. We don't need to do it again. Let's move on. <laughs> like, yeah. like imagine in a TV show acting, doing the same thing. I'd be just like, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I would yeah. like, oh, lose gosh. it. I would have no <laughs> patience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get, I get that. Um, all right. Well, I, I want to be mindful of your time because we're already past the, the hour and a half. Um, where can people find you, follow you, listen to your podcast? podcast all that stuff yeah so there's two places you can find me one is melius consulting um mm-hmm. and that's dot com.au that's if okay. you kind of want to engage with us from an industry perspective you want us to mm-hmm. work with your, your company and so on so we do work across the world doing different things amazing and then the other part then where most people probably go to is sleep for performance.com.au and on sleep for performance you can find more about me you can find the podcast which i think is 140 episodes wow there's um maybe 50 blogs or more. We've had seminars over the last three years. Amazing. And there's about 16 speakers in each seminar. So it's about 50 odd talks there or more. Wow. Um, because we had some guest speakers in as well. So it's probably over 50 talks there that you can listen to from different scientists. Um, Amazing. Stuff on TV, videos, all that. There's there's loads of stuff there. So just go and prove that. It's all free and feel free to share with your friends and network. So I'm cool. also more active on LinkedIn. Mm. Um. I don't really post on Facebook um, or Twitter. And then I do a little bit on Instagram as well, um, but probably ma- mainly LinkedIn, okay. LinkedIn and Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, we will link all of that in the show notes for the listeners to check that out. Website, podcasts, LinkedIn, all of that. And thank you again so much for your time. This was amazing. We no I problem. learned a ton. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.